As a result, a total of 1,211 remote area youth have been enrolled in tertiary institutions, while 360 formal employment jobs were offered over the past year. Housing. Madam Speaker, as part of the government's effort to provide shelter for the needy, government has begun construction of 451 destitute houses during the financial year, 2012-13. For this financial year, we have further approved construction of 404 houses at a cost of 45 million pula. Out of these housing units since the financial year to date, 416 are for the needy in rural and RADP areas. In addition, the presidential housing appeal for the needy has so far constructed 316 houses through contributions from the private sector, individuals, and public offices, while another 200 houses have been pledged. I wish to take this opportunity to thank all those generous and compassionate individuals and companies for their support in this regard. Government has further approved construction of 481 houses for destitute persons who were victims of floods in various districts. Since 2008, local authorities have initiated 2,606 Shah House Improvement Projects, out of which 1,938 are completed. 502 are ongoing, with just over 19 million pula dispersed to 472 beneficiaries last year. We also continue to implement the Poverty Alleviation and Housing Program, through which participants build their own homes through revenues and material they receive from brick molding. Since its inception, this program has resulted in the construction of 120 housing units. During the 2012-13 financial year, Botswana Housing Corporation completed a total of 402 houses, while 259 units are at different stages of construction. Another 153 are being built by the BHC through Shah Turnkey Project. Health. Madam Speaker, government is steadfast in its commitment to provide quality health care services for all Botswana. A number of initiatives have therefore been introduced to improve customer care. A number of public relations focal nurses attend to patients and their families at the point of service in all health facilities. District and referral facilities now offer special access to those with special needs, such as the elderly and those living with disabilities. We have further extended the operations of some clinics from 8 to 24 hours. Last year's establishment of a call center in Habaruni, where ambulances are dispatched from a central point, is also yielding good results. Similar centers have now been established in Mahalape and Francis Town. As of August 2013, the average availability of vital, essential, and necessary medicines at government health facilities was 74 percent, while the availability at, of laboratory supplies at the CMS stood at 100%. Efforts to improve access to quality medicines include the decentralization of dispensing of specialist medicines to clinics. We're also piloting the engagement of private pharmacies for the dispensing of chronic medications to government-sponsored patients, which to date has serviced more than 3,000 individuals. Last year, I reported that healthcare services specialists were being placed in referrals and district hospitals. I'm now pleased to be able to confirm that this has resulted in a significant reduction in the turnaround time to access specialist um, services. The program is further strengthening the centers of excellence in the areas of cancer, kidney and heart disease, eye care and orthopedics, thus reducing the need for costly referrals to South Africa, whilst enhancing our own access to quality services. Our capacity to deliver quality health care as well as training will soon be enhanced by the completion of the 450-bed academic medical teaching hospital at the University of Botswana, which will be commissioned at the end of 2014. Madam Speaker, government is assessing ways of financing health services with financial and technical support from the World Health Organization, PEPFAR, and USAID. A study is underway to more accurately measure the total cost of providing health services, which will assist us in budgeting for an essential health service package. To achieve our Millennium Development Goals of reducing maternal and child mortality, government has introduced a national quality improvement project to, ac to ensure access to quality maternal health services. Further efforts to reduce child mortality through the uptake of high-impact interventions at household level are underway. 
We are also exploring innovations in the delivery of healthcare to remote areas. Let me take this opportunity to commend members of the private sector who have come forward to generously assist government in the construction and upgrading of health posts and clinics. The AS Dada Foundation has since 2010 contributed five clinics while pledging four more. The Motivac Group has built one with two more pledged, while Choppies has built one with three more pledged. I'm further pleased to report that their good example is being emulated by others outside of government who are coming forward with pledges of additional facilities. Since 2008, government in partnership with industry, NGO and community stakeholders has been taking proactive measures to combat the harmful effects of alcohol in society in line with WHO guidelines. Interventions have included the alcohol levy, which is going to be increased again, by the way, in the next month or two, <laughs> which, which as of July 2013, the alcohol levy has collected a cumulative total of 1.1 billion pula. Public education and awareness, reduced hours of operation of alcohol outlets, and amendment of the Road Traffic Act. I'm pleased to be able to report that between 2008 and 2011, per capita, pure alcohol consumption amongst adults has declined, although it remains above the regional average. Tobacco use. Tobacco use is a risk factor for non-communicable diseases, which are on the rise in Botswana. We have thus been implementing tobacco prevention and control initiatives. For example, we have introduced a 30% tobacco levy, which will be used to address the growing burden of tobacco use. We are also in the process of repealing the Tobacco Control of Smoking Act of 1992, which will be replaced by, a, by more comprehensive legislation. HIV and AIDS. Madam Speaker, until we reach our target of zero new infections, combating HIV AIDS will remain a priority. In this respect, while we shall continue to provide therapy to those in need, we know that there is no substitute for behavior change among those who still put themselves and others at risk through a lack of self-discipline. Although the incidence of HIV in our country declined by 71% between 2001 and 2011, it is still far too high. While the need for greater discipline in defeating the scourge is a message for all generations, we are especially concerned about our youth who constitute our hope for an AIDS-free generation. The one group who do not have a choice when it comes to HIV's infection are the unborn. Government thus remains committed to the elimination of mother-to-child transmission of the virus, which is currently pleasingly at or below 2%. We also continue to have an ARV uptake of about 95%. To cater for this demand by the end of the year, ARV services will be available at all health facilities. While this outreach is a clear reflection of our continued commitment and compassion, it also constitutes a serious financial burden with overall annual allocation for HIV AIDS now standing at some 1.2 billion pula. The uptake of safe male circumcision remains low at just over 89,000 as of August 2013, which represents 23% of the national target of 385,000 men between the ages of 13 and 49. The youth. Madam Speaker, as I've observed on many occasions, besides being relatively well-educated, the youth of this country have an abundance of talent. What they need in the light of current levels of unemployment and underemployment is more opportunities as well as additional skills to take advantage of existing ones. I'm thus pleased to report that the success rate of ongoing youth-funded project stands at 87.7%, which should encourage us to do more. Government has recently approved the local procurement scheme, which allows for preferential, preferential treatment for women, youth, and people with disabilities. This will improve the general performance sustain and sustainability of youth projects. The Youth Development Fund continues to finance youth entrepreneurs in the form of 
50% grant, 50% loan. A total of 2,908 projects have received funding of just over 274 million pula since the inception of the program in 2009. Of these projects, 151 have so far been funded during the current financial year. Altogether, the projects have created a total of 4,837 jobs. To improve the program effectiveness, project funding has been combined with pre- and post-funding interventions to enhance recipients' business and management skills, while marketing assistance is also being extended. Government is further developing a youth ICT empowerment and employment strategy. We have, through the Youth Empowerment Scheme, embarked upon an integrated approach to the creation of vocational opportunities for unemployed youth, while simultaneously contributing to the development of their communities. The scheme incorporates the inculcation of life skills, startup capacity building, and on-the-job training. Government has then sponsored a CITF construction multi-skilling program, which has benefited a total of 160 participants recently. Over the past year, 5,002 young people attended youth empowerment festivals, business ability workshops, and basic business management training, while 464 have also been assisted to attend different expositions to exhibit and market their products. These programs are being implemented in partnership with private and parastatal stakeholders who have assisted by releasing their facilities and personnel. To date, 3,299 participants have attended YES boot camps, with 1,893 graduates having been attached to various government departments and private entities. Moreover, a total of 229 young people with disabilities have attended YES mini camps for youth with disabilities, of whom 72 are already attached to various government departments. To promote good social values and influence good behavior amongst the youth, role modeling, psychosocial support, peer education and HIV AIDS testing and counseling continue to be promoted. In the year under review, 3,540 young people were reached through the AIDS swagger activities, a communication campaign targeting behavior change. Edutainment roadshows were also held in various settlements to sensitize young people on livelihood issues. The National Internship Program also continues to be a platform for skills transfer and development. Intern enrollment, as at the end of September 2013, stood at 4,137. Since inception to date, 3,558, 3,587 interns have graduated to permanent employment. <clears throat> to provide additional opportunities while stimulating the spirit of community service, discipline, and self-help amongst youth, as well as empower them with additional competencies. The government will introduce a new national service program for all out-of-school youth between the ages of 20 and 30. Unlike the old Direlos Chaba, it will be a voluntary program. While acquiring skills, participants will assist in the delivery of public services for community and youth development, including such fields as agriculture extension, health education, poverty eradication, remote area development, cooperative marketing, infrastructure maintenance, and various advocacy and empowerment initiatives. We intend to roll up to 15,000 young people as participants next year. The new service will be separate from the internship program, which will continue to exist for graduates. Both will be jointly administered by the Ministry of Youth, Sport, and Culture to ensure synergies. Participants can serve up to the age of 30, but may exit the program at any time. While participation in the program does not constitute full-time employment, those enrolled will be given a monthly allowance with an additional monthly sum being paid into an interest-bearing account to be paid out to the participants following the completion of at least one year's service. <laughs> Education. <clears throat> Education. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, government has commenced the process of transforming the education sector to make it more responsive to current needs and emerging needs. A comprehensive five-year education and tra training sector, strategic sector plan, 2014-2018, is scheduled for completion in June 2014. 
The plan will guide the prioritization, harmonization, and resource allocation in the delivery of the education sector. For this financial year, critical flagships have been identified and are being implemented. These include introduction of a one-year reception class in public schools, turnaround strategy for low-performing schools at secondary level, and the strengthening of the technical and vocational education and training sector. The one-year reception classes, which were successfully piloted in the Kalahari region, will be rolled out to selected schools in all regions in 2014. Quality education can never be attained without the active participation of parents, teachers, and the wider community, as well as willing and disciplined students. Through PTAs, government continues to accord parents a platform to support the education of their children. As part of the community outreach, schools have been drawing on the time and experience of professionals to support and mentor them in areas of management as well as learning. More than 400 mentors have been registered. Government also continues to use the Excellence Award Initiative and the Top Chief Achiever Scholarship Program to motivate, to motivate high achievement amongst students. Progress made with respect to access and equity in the provision of education includes increase in primary school net enrollment rate from 89.7% last year to 93.1% this year. Transition rate from junior to senior secondary increased from 63% last year to 67% this year. And special education learner enrollment increased from 1,071 to 1,153 in the same period. The Back to School initiative has provided out of school and unemployed youth who dropped out of the school system with another opportunity to re enter the education and training system. There has been an overwhelming response to the program. 67,073 learners applied, and to date, 33,044 re-entrants have been successfully reabsorbed into the education and training system at all levels from primary to tertiary. Yeah. <clears throat> These young people have an opportunity to gain a higher qualification and certification, new knowledge and skills, and enhanced career prospects for improved livelihoods. The remaining applicants will be placed over a range of programs in the next two years. The Botswana International University of Science and Technology, BUST, which began operations at UDI in August 2012, will have fully, UDI, will have fully relocated to its Palapi campus by June 2014. To further enhance the tertiary sector, the Botswana College of Agriculture will be transformed into a fully-fledged university beginning in the next financial year. This will bring the total number of public and private universities in our country to five, three of which have been established in the last two years. Madam Speaker, since 2008, our country's tertiary education sector has been transformed due to current government's decision to support the development of local tertiary institutions in the private as well as public sector. Our expenditure on local tertiary institutions this year stands at 1.6 billion pula. This has resulted in a 75% reduction in external placements since 2008 from 8,630 to now 2,325, with corresponding savings as well as a doubling in the number of students studying in local institutions from 22,027 to over 44,000, including 41,898 placements. The growing status of our, lo of our local tertiary institutions is further reflected in the enrollment of international students, which this year stands at 1,219, up from 275 in 2010. E-government. Madam Speaker, since 2008, there has been an explosion in the use of ICT by Botswana. With domestic internet subscriptions, mostly on mobile devices, rising from just over 250,000 at the end of 2011 to nearly 1 million by August 2013, meaning that at least half of our citizens are now active online. Given this transformation, government recognizes the need to accelerate the rollout of e-government 
through expanded online services. Concern about long queues for some services provided through ICT systems, such as civil and national registration, as well as transport permits and driver's licenses, are being addressed, while births and deaths registration system has been stabilized with the backlog of certificates being drastically reduced. <clears throat> as part of our overarching commitment to rationalize parastatals, the Botswana Communications Regulatory Authority was formed in April as a converged regulator overseeing telecommunications, internet, and associated online technologies, broadcasting, and personal services. Further progress has been achieved in separation of assets and the privatization of BTC. This exercise has also so far resulted in the formation of two companies, being the Botswana Fiber Networks, uh, responsible for managing wholesale services, and Botswana Telecommunications Limited for retail services. With the completion of the West African submarine cable system at a cost of over 300 million pula, in addition to the East African cable, wholesale internet tariffs have been reduced by up to 59%, with resulting retail price reductions, a trend which should continue. To further improve our global competitiveness, our licensing framework is being adjusted to introduce a new license category for wholesale operators to facilitate competition and innovation. Efforts continue to be made to ensure that communities are provided with access to communication services. The Interletza One resuscitation project was completed in March this year. This initiative brought mobile voice, data, and internet connectivity to some 177 villages. To further benefit from the existing Interletza infrastructure, we are retooling the Kitsong centers by introducing more products to improve their utilization. To further connect the nation, free internet facilities are being provided at 39 public libraries and village reading rooms, while another 33 are to be connected through wireless technology. With the support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, some 45,000 members of the public have also been trained in basic computer skills through the Sesiro E Public Libraries project. In addition, Nine libraries have been completed through our partnership with the Robert and Sarah Rothschild Family Foundation, while two more libraries are scheduled for completion in Guetta and Nata by April 2014. To address the issue of long queues at its front offices, the Department of Road Transport and Safety has joined hands with Botswana Post to provide renewal of vehicle licenses at all 122 post offices. A decision has been made to decentralize transport services provided by CTO by devolving fleet management to ministries. To further enhance efficiencies in government, transport fuel management will be outsourced to the private sector. All the above will be managed and monitored by the fleet tracking management and maintenance system. Media. Perhaps the best evidence of the continued vibrancy of our democracy is that criticism of all sorts is expected, and when constructive, readily embraced. Can anyone look at the daily output of our diverse domestic media and honestly deny that freedom of expression has continued to flourish, even if in some cases it is abused? But even the most abusive output comes with a silver lining in that the barrage of criticism this government receives from much of the press has contributed in no small measure to our country's superior global rankings in various surveys of democracy, tolerance, and personal freedom. For its part, our public service media have made strides in reaching greater numbers of Botswana online, as well as through print and broadcast media while maintaining their status as our country's most trusted sources of news and information. This has been achieved through expanded transmitter coverage, enhanced satellite capacity, and the growing popularity of our e-communications, as well as wider daily news distribution. With respect to television, we have now begun the process of migrating from analog to digital terrestrial uh, broadcasting. Having adopted the Integrated Systems Digital Broadcasting Terrestrial, or ISDBT, developed in Japan as our national standard. 
This decision was made after comparative testing confirmed its, superi its superiority as a platform for mobile as well as fixed free to air transmission, which opens the door for Botswana to receive television through their phones and other mobile devices. To this end, government has built the required terrestrial transmissions network. A project management office is being set up to drive the process by reaching out to industry stakeholders and the general public to ensure that the next generation of television positively enhances the lives of Botswana. Our progress in interactive online communications is reflected in the rising traffic on the government e-portal and Facebook this past year, as well as the new daily news and Kutuano websites. Radio Botswana and RB2 are now also live streaming, meaning that they can be listened to online from anywhere in the world. I'm also pleased to note that aspirant artists continue to record in our studios as a public service. The Daily News is also continuing to engage young freelance reporters, focusing on increasing its coverage of rural areas. Culture. Madam Speaker, government recognizes that our cultural heritage, like our natural heritage, is a unique asset that needs to be nurtured and developed. In this respect, we have started the ratification process of the 2005 UNESCO Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions, which will enhance the contribution of culture to development. The President's Day competitions and constituency art competitions have contributed to a reawakening of our cultural values and practices while promoting artistic talent, especially among the youth. The President's Day competitions have grown significantly, both in terms of participation and expanded categories. Participation this year stood at 14,061 whereas in 2012, it was 12,562. The constituency art competitions held in August 2012 attracted 12,599 participants, while those this year attracted 18,640 participants. Madam Speaker, the countdown towards the celebrations of Botswana's 50th anniversary of independence in 2016 has started. Today marks 1,061 days before the Golden Jubilee celebrations of our country. Our theme for the celebrations is Botswana first, Botswana Pele. The 2016 independence celebrations will also coincide with the end of the Vision 2016 cycle, and we must all work hard to ensure that the vision becomes a reality. Sport and recreation. Madam Speaker, we recognize that the development and promotion of sport contributes to economic growth and diversification. Over the past year, we hosted a number of major sports events which benefited the country through sports tourism. To place sports on a sounder footing, the Botswana National Sports Commission Bill of 2013 has been drafted and is expected to be presented to Parliament during the next sitting. Constituency sports tournaments continue to be popular. Participation rates have grown from 28,000 476 at inception to 65,146 this year. To date, to date, the program has contributed to the expansion of sporting codes and talent identification, with a number of players having graduated from constituency tournaments to mainstream league teams since its inception. Some teams have also utilized prize money to sponsor players to study in different fields. Botswana athletes continue to impress in regional, continental, and international competitions. For example, our well-known Amant Amantle Munzu has retained her gold medal title at the 2013 Samsung Diamond League, whilst Nigel Amos also became a gold medalist at the 2012 World University Games in the 800 meter event. Moreover this, year, <clears throat> moreover, this year, another six Botswana football players joined professional ranks, bringing the total number to 12. To build on success sessions, additional attention has been paid to grassroots sports development, especially through the school system. Botswana will host the second Africa Youth Games in May 2014. 
An organizing committee for the Games was appointed and is working to ensure that the Games are a success. The Games Committee has further appealed to the private sector and civil society for support. In this respect, I wish to especially thank the Choppies Group for their donation of 8.5 million pula towards the event. We hope, <clears throat> we hope other companies doing business in Botswana will be motivated to engage in similar social responsibility gestures. Global cooperation. Madam Speaker, as a small nation, in an increasingly complex and competitive globalized world, our foreign policy remains anchored in working through multilateral institutions. As such, we continue to play an active role within the United Nations and other international and regional organizations, notably the UN, the AU and the SADC, to which we belong. Our international engagements are predicated on advancing our national interests, which include such transnational priorities as promoting sustainable economic development, good governance, and international peace and security. Guided by the principles and spirit of the United Nations Charter, we actively support positions on global issues that advance the, the interests of humankind. Over the past 12 months, we had the privilege of welcoming dignitaries from various parts of the world whose visits contributed to a deepening of our relations. We have also been privileged to host a number of high-level meetings. These have included the Africa Regional Workshop on the ratification of the Kampala Amendments related to the crime of aggression respect to the International Criminal Court. The workshop, which was attended by all African state parties to the Rome Statute, raised awareness about the importance of these amendments, which Botswana was the first African country to ratify. Our capital city has also hosted a number of regional, industrial, and commercial gatherings, reflecting its growing status as an international conference venue. Our international undertakings are shaped by humanitarian values and a sense of global solidarity, as well as national interests. In keeping with our capacity, we thus continue to provide modest relief contributions in response to external needs. As a country, we further honor our international commitments through material contributions and adherence to our treaty obligations. I'm also happy to inform this House that despite the many development challenges that confront us, Botswana continues to contribute to the noble ideas of South-South cooperation. In this context, we have over the last year engaged sister countries of Malawi, Liberia, and South Sudan with a view to advance our common development agenda. Our modest efforts in these countries include contribution to human resources development such as training through scholarships, collaboration in mining and agriculture. We will continue to actively work with these countries and indeed others to explore mutually beneficial cooperation in pursuit of our development aspirations. Given our commitment to human rights and universal values, we have associated ourselves with a global consensus that atrocities committed by the Assad regime against its own people in Syria through the use of conventional as well as chemical weapons are a clear threat to world peace and security, as well as the livelihoods of the Syrian people. We are thus disappointed by the inability of the United Nations Security Council to bring an end to this ongoing carnage, which has claimed the lives of more than 100,000 people, while causing another 2 million to become refugees outside their country. Our firm conviction that robust action to hold this regime accountable for its crimes is long overdue. This further convinces us of the need to reform the United Nations Security Council to enable it to respond to such behavior. Over the past year, we have also been concerned with the tragic consequences of acts of terrorism that have occurred on our own continent and elsewhere, such as the recent instances of mass murder in Kenya, Nigeria, and Pakistan. Our sympathy shall continue to go out to all the victims of such violence, whatever may be their nationality, their politics, or their faith. For whenever and wherever terror attacks are perpetrated, humanity as a whole is robbed of something of its material and spiritual well-being. 
With respect to Zimbabwe, we have carried out our regional responsibilities as a good neighbor as well as a good SADC member in candidly expressing our concerns about the recent electoral process. This was in line with the findings not only of our own election observers, but of those of other observer missions. At the same time, of course, we do assure the Zimbabweans and their government of our continued commitment to enhance bilateral cooperation for the mutual, mutual benefit of our peoples as we are neighbors. Madam Speaker, let me take this opportunity to once more express on behalf of the nation our appreciation for the generous external assistance we continue to receive from elsewhere in facilitating our development process. I therefore wish to express our gratitude to all the countries, international organizations, including private institutions and individuals who have assisted us. In conclusion, Madam Speaker, by pulling together, we can build a better country, one that is globally competitive while remaining true to its unique identity and values. The path to a more prosperous and productive nation that leaves no citizen behind lies not so much in the bounty of natural resources with which the Lord has blessed our land as in our human resources, that is, ourselves. Let us therefore be mindful that the evolution of any democracy requires patriotism and collective discipline, beginning with self-discipline. In this way, we shall achieve the productivity necessary to compete in the world while overcoming the social ills that threaten to pull us down. It is true that we live in challenging times, but so too did the generations who come before us. Thanks to them, we today share a nation whose social economic progress over the past five decades has been second to none. Where they achieved much with little, we can achieve much more. Finally, in meeting our challenges while reaching for our goals, let us remember to seek the blessings and guidance of the Lord in all our endeavors. For in the end, it is only through his grace and our efforts that all things are possible. Let us also hope that he will answer our prayers for rain. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.